A Musical Life with Holly Mulcahy, concertmaster of the Chattanooga Symphony and Opera and queen of classical music culture. What do you wear to a symphony concert? When do you clap? And why is the timpani player smelling his drums? <laughs> Violinist and etiquette expert Holly Mulcahy provides the answers to these compelling questions in her popular blog, Neoclassical, as well as thoughts on the pursuit of happiness as a musician, even when it means leaving a full-time position in an orchestra. Welcome to A Musical Life. I'm Hugh Sung. Before we get started with my conversation with Holly, I have an announcement to make. This coming Thursday, March the 10th, if you happen to be in the Indianapolis area, I will be giving a performance lecture as part of Anderson University's Intellectual Innovation Idea U series on my life as an entrepreneur artist and vision for changing the world through artistic innovation. The presentation begins at 7.30 in Anderson's York Performance Hall, and I'll be joined by violinist Gert Kumi demonstrating my iPad as a digital sheet music reader and my air turn pedals for turning pages hands-free in performance. The lecture performance is free and open to the public, so I'd love to see you there. For more information, visit www.anderson.edu forward slash arts hyphen events, or call Anderson University's School of Music, Theater, and Dance at 800-619-3047. If you've never been to a classical music concert, it can be a bit intimidating the very first time you go to one. There seems to be a whole world of etiquette and protocol that can make the experience seem, well, aloof and elitist, at least in some people's eyes. Now, orchestras and arts administrators are keenly aware of how important it is to try to make classical music more accessible to grow future audiences. And in some cases, they're trying to think of ways to do away with some of the traditional conventions. But for violinist Holly Mulcahy, these rituals and rules of etiquette are part of what makes the classical music concert so special. And a deeper understanding of them can serve to enhance one's experience in a concert hall, making it much more memorable and enjoyable. Holly maintains a busy schedule as concertmaster of the Chattanooga Symphony and Opera and as a soloist and chamber musician. She's also the author of Neoclassical, a blog that discusses the future of classical music and helps to demystify the culture of classical music in a warm, witty, and welcoming way. Holly, welcome to the show. It's so lovely to have you here. Thank you so much for having me. I've looked forward to this. <laughs> Thank you. In fact, uh, I really appreciate it. Your blog, Neoclassical, was one of the first blogs to help announce the launch of this show, A Musical Life. So for that, really, thank you so much. Oh, absolutely. Now, speaking of your blog, which is very popular, once again, it's called Neoclassical. I was reading through it, and some of your most popular posts deal with topics of orchestra etiquette and helping folks understand some of the idiosyncrasies of classical music performance. Now, your blog articles have included such titles as 
what to wear to the symphony, when to clap at the symphony, and this is my favorite, why is the timpani player smelling his drums and seven <laughs> other awesome questions from the audience. I love that. So, uh, and oh, there's one more great question from that article, which was, why is nobody even looking at the conductor? <laughs> so if you don't mind, because the, I know we're, we're kind of rehashing your, your blog posts, but why don't we go through some of the answers to these great questions? So let's start off with what to wear to a symphony orchestra concert? What are your recommendations? Well, first of all, the reason I wrote this was because I found through uh, search terms to get to my blog, a lot of people were trying to look for what to wear to the symphony. People were actually Googling that question, huh? Oh, uh, that's that's the number one Googled question. And that's I get about 200 hits a day on my site alone with just that question. <laughs> How and about that? Ironically, it's usually Friday or Saturday when people are like going, oh my goodness, I've got to go to the symphony. What do I wear? <laughs> um, and I got a, a lot of flack from people within the industry saying, well, they can wear what they want. They should know this. It's on our website. But being a woman and maybe going out to cocktail parties, you know, I call six of my friends and I want to know what they're wearing because you don't want to <laughs> stick out. <laughs> you know, <laughs> nobody wants to look like a fool. And I think people generally want a guideline, not not kind of like, you know, wear what you're comfortable, but here's what normal people show up in. And if you're comfortable with that, great. And if not, mazel tov. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so I wanted to give basic ideas of what generally people wear. And I give a couple of categories as far as the time of day the concert is, the type of concert, if it's a gala concert to show up a little more you know, in your updo and your your cocktail dress, or if it's just a family concert, my goodness, come in jeans. <laughs> <laughs> and for the, let's say, let's break it down to the two most common concerts, matinee, daytime concerts, and evening performances that are on a regular subscription schedule. What's your recommendation for fashion for women and for men? Well, I think judging from what I'm seeing in the audience, and this is from just basically Midwest, Chicago, all the way down to where I play right now, Chattanooga, during the matinee concerts, people seem to feel most comfortable in you know, like a, a trouser type pant or just a interesting slacks and, and a blouse. But people also who come in well, you know, nice looking jeans feel very welcome and, and they don't stick out. I think cutoffs or um, pajama bottoms and <laughs> Ugg, Ugg boots are probably not what we you know, you wouldn't feel comfortable wearing it. But if, you know, you're, you're supposed to wear what you're comfortable in, if that's what you are, fine, show up in it. Um, as far as evening concerts, I think more people like to tend to wear suits. Women like to dress up, I've found. They, um, in the symphony, the office part of it, people say, you know, we don't want to give a connotation of snobbery or whatever, but ladies like to dress it up. And to, to get a chance to put on that awesome dress that you only get to wear once a year or twice a year, this is where you can do it. Um, we, I think, probably should draw the line. This is don't come in your coronation outfit and <laughs> <laughs> leave the tiara at home. <laughs> so so there's, there's a limit to how much we can deck it out, huh? <laughs> well, uh, yeah, I think, I think if you're worried about how to fit in, um, yeah, unless unless you don't care, and then fine, come in it. That's okay. <laughs> now, it's interesting you mentioned uh, that some of your colleagues and perhaps even some of the folks who work in the administration or staff of the orchestra was giving you some flack for taking a fashion stance, as it were. But as you mentioned, this can be a wonderful opportunity, as especially for women, to wear the things that they they want to wear. So do you find having fashion suggestions like this for classical concerts – is it helpful? I mean, I think classical musicians are so worried about these days of, of, of exactly what you described of being seen as uh, too pretentious or too snobbery. But do you think right. having good, helpful, and really down-to-earth suggestions that are by no means set in stone, do you think that provides a cultural opportunity to, you know, you think of in the pop world, you think of going out to a club, a nightclub, right? right. Um, they have very, you know, they're they're going the the people who are at the doors are going to turn away people who are not dressed appropriately, believe it or not, to go out dancing. If you're not looking good, if you're not hot in fashion, they're going to turn you away. And that doesn't stop people from queuing up in long lines to go on, into these fashionable, trendy clubs precisely to look good. Right. 
I think that the number one thing that I try to convey to uh, my blog audience and to people who have not really ventured into the world of classical music concerts is just the feeling of comfort and feeling of welcome. And people really want to know what to wear. They don't want to just hear wear what's comfortable. They want to know what everybody else is wearing because to them, this is, this is their experiment or they're putting themselves out in an uncomfortable zone of going to something different like a symphony if they're not used to it. And they want to fit in and they don't want to, you know, feel uncomfortable at all. It's the same thing when I went to a hockey game. I didn't know what to expect, so I Googled what do people wear. <laughs> and um, good thing I did because I would have just come in jeans and a you know a, a, a t-shirt or whatever. No, people who go to hockey games wear jerseys. Actually, they're called sweaters, oh. and they've got the numbers on it and your team logo, and it's important. So I, I was kind of really that was fortuitous looking that up. It would have been bad news if I showed up without that Chicago Blackhawks jersey <laughs> on. <laughs> so I just want to offer people a handout to say, you know, here's how to feel comfortable and give them the caveat. If you don't want to wear it and you feel like wearing this, that's cool. Mm. We, we want we want you. Um, but I think people just want the rules. How cool. All right. So let's go into that other question. When to clap? At the symphony, can you can you go now? You know, for folks who go to rock concerts, who go out to jazz sets, uh, you know, they there are places and times. You know, for a rock concert, you'll clap the whole show. <laughs> Everybody's right. screaming throughout the whole time. In a <laughs> jazz concert, you'll hear somebody make a solo, and when they finish their solo, and another instrument takes over, then everybody's cued to kind of clap that soloist. But for classical music. You know, you hear both sides of the fence. Some people say, yeah, let them clap whenever they want. And other people say, no, 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 there are proper times to clap. Give us your stance on the issue. Well, I think, um, once again, making people feel welcome is number one. And I give a couple of suggestions that if it ends really loud and it feels like you're, you want to clap, by all means, clap. <laughs> um, and then, of course, the, the argument comes up, but what about Tchaikovsky Symphony 6, for example, where the third movement ends really loud and then there's the quiet movement? You've ruined the moment. Well, I disagree with that. It's um, when Unless the conductor says, hold applause, please, to give the most amount of pressure or to, to get this feeling that I want to convey. Unless the conductor says that, have at it. Let that emotion <laughs> out because yeah. it's just a release of emotion. And I think that when you pay, I don't know, 20 to $150 for a ticket, you, you should own that moment. It's yours. And, and I think. And feel free to sh share your appreciation. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so I, I just, I, I think that there are certain etiquette points where you don't want to clap. Like if a piece is just kind of dwindled down and it's just faded, you kind of want to let that moment sit for a while. Um, there are people in the audience, some of them, um, sometimes students will try to clap early. Like, I know this is the end and they will start clapping immediately. And, you know, it just happens. It's a live concert. But I think the number one thing is to, to the guidelines that I've given in that particular blog, just you want to feel comfortable and you can use certain social cues, um, like if everybody else is clapping or if nobody else is clapping. But um, and generally, if it's a loud, boisterous ending, have at it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now, help us understand why is the timpani player smelling his <laughs> drums? <laughs> this was one of the the most fun to write. Um, <laughs> I, I come from non-musical parents. Both my brother and I are, are professional musicians in professional symphonies. Um, and my, our parents are not musical whatsoever. Um, and they've come up with some of these questions themselves, like, hey, why is this? And it's like, wow, you know, if they're asking that question, there's got to be a bunch of other people asking that question. Sure. And seeing those things through their eyes, I was like, well, geez, it does look like he's smelling his drums <laughs> <You know? laughs> on earth. Um, you look back at him and just, just seeing it through non-musician eyes, you, you can really think there's a lot of weirdness going on on stage. <laughs> um, so he, he's tuning his drums, but ah. he has to do it really quietly because, you know, while you're playing in an orchestra, 
um, the tympanist might be trying to get to the next movement's pitches correctly, but it looks like they're smelling their drums. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and why is nobody looking at the conductor when the orchestra is playing? I love that question because I know I've been guilty of that. <laughs> well, yeah, you know, the, the, uh, the, that whole, there's a peripheral kind of sense. Everybody is kind of focused on the music. Nobody has their music memorized. Um, and it, you're just kind of like going from the, the, the feeling of, of just certain movements. Sometimes we all will look up for a downbeat. Um, sometimes we can just see what we need to. Um, it's the musician that stares at the conductor that you have to worry about. <laughs> <laughs> nothing, nothing freaks out a conductor more than staring. <laughs> so, um, yeah, the conductor, we all see through peripheral vision mm. generally. You know, it's interesting, just again, touching back a little bit in some of the cultural rules, if you will, it's it's not unlike the experience of going to a, you know, a fine restaurant or, or ex- even experiencing a nice bottle of wine. Sure, you can just get whatever you want, drink it any way you want. And yet, you know, when you want to heighten or get the most out of that experience, if you're drinking a glass of wine, there's all these little tips to say smell the you know smell the perfume the bloom of the wine let it roll around let it let it you know air out for a while before getting to, to get the maximum taste and swish it in your mouth and chew on it all those other funny little rules you don't have to do that but for those folks who again want to get the most out of that experience i think these little rules perhaps contribute to making it more enjoyable. For instance, you know, just like what to wear, when to clap, and just being a part of the the cultural experience and enjoying it to the max, wouldn't you say? I would. And and to go on with that um, that cultural uh, equivalent of drinking wine, it's um it's a curiosity that hopefully will breed more curiosity. I mean, showing up and kind of figuring out when to clap or or what to wear, hopefully will allow for a little freedom so that you can think huh, who is that Beethoven guy? And my goodness, Michael Doherty, that first piece on the program? Wow, that's I, I'd like to hear more of that. Mm. So just kind of creating a an open curiosity, um, just the same way with wines, because, you know, what's after wine? You want to start looking into ports, you want to start looking into scotches. Um, it's just curiosity. Absolutely. Now, you're currently the concertmaster of the Chattanooga Symphony and Opera. For folks who are completely new to classical music, can you help us understand what exactly does a concertmaster do? That I get asked that question so often. <laughs> and by, by some of our patrons, uh, one of our patrons last week said, so you just walk out on stage and you wear the pretty shoes? Is that all you do? And, <laughs> <laughs> and you have to sit very close to the conductor, too. Yes, I wish. Um, but actually, the job of a concertmaster is basically a liaison from the conductor to the orchestra, and I'm also the second face, really, the orchestra, the audience um, generally sees um, when they when they think of the orchestra. There is also connection to the section, from the violin section to the viola section to the cellos. I set up all the bowings, um, try to anticipate what a conductor may need, and kind of measure what I've got in my section. Uh, as far as skill and and personalities and trying to come up with the best possible musical experience before the first rehearsal. So it's a lot of anticipation of um, personalities. Now, when you're talking about Boeings, again, just for folks who are not familiar with the term, that refers to the direction that everybody basically uses their bows on the strings, going up or going down, and a good orchestra coordinates it so everybody is moving their bows in the same direction. It's like a synchronized um, synchronized swim team that's all moving <laughs> together at the same yeah. time. That's, that's actually a lot more work than most people, I think, appreciate. It is a lot of work. And I wrote a blog about this that I found out that it was pretty popular. People were very curious how everybody was so, you know, was synchronized in the, uh, in the whole section. Um, so check that blog out. Um, and basically, I get music about a year in advance for our season, big oh, wow. stack of it, yeah. And um, I will take, you know, as, as, of, as I develop my relationship with our conductor in Chattanooga, Kyoko Dan, I try to see her personality, I try to know, what, you know, guess which tempo she's going to take. I also calculate, you know, how, how much our hall, how much of the uh, 
resonance factor there is. It, it doesn't, um, it's not Carnegie Hall, but it's, um, you've got to work with certain idiosyncrasies to try to make it sound as good as possible. Um, on any given concert, I may have between 10 to 15 first violins. So if I'm going to be down on numbers and we're playing a big piece, I've got to add a little bit more bow to give it a little bit more strength. So there's a lot of calculations that go in on this. And, and of course, musically speaking, you know, how can I make the, the music really sing out the best possible way? And you're so. the person really in charge of putting all of that together for your team, the orchestra. Yes, wow. yes. So why does the concert master always walk in late to the concert? <laughs> <laughs> I think, you know, it's a traditional thing. Um, there's a lot of, uh, of ideas of how this came. But for right now, in our day and age, the concert master comes out uh, to prepare the orchestra, to kind of prepare the audience and get them settled down, you know, as we tune, it's it's kind of a, a, a cue for the audience to like, yeah, the concert's starting. And then the conductor comes out um, and it's just kind of a, almost like an overture to the conductor coming out, if you will. Um, but also the concert master will, you know, allow for if a wind instrument needs to tune a little longer, I'll stay standing until the winds are completely done tuning or until like the last violinist is, you know, trying to get a string that has slipped suddenly. Mm. So that it also lets the conductor and the stage hands in the back know that the orchestra is indeed ready. Now, in addition to your concert master duties, you maintain an active performing career. Next year, I understand March 2nd, 2017, you will be performing Jim Stevenson's Violin Concerto. Can you tell us a bit about this concerto? This concerto is a uh, modern. It, I'll be the second violinist to play it. It was premiered in Minnesota with Osmo Vanska and Jennifer Fausti. Um, it was written for Jennifer and Minnesota. And I picked it because of the the level of excitement when I did the Higdon Violin Concerto last year. So there was so much buzz about wanting another American living composer played that I searched and Jim's piece just, just bit me. It just was incredible. Um, the things that I was looking for was a full orchestra, orchestra parts that really feature the orchestra, not only the violin soloist me, but you know my colleagues absolutely will have a great chance to shine. And uh, Jim's going to come. So there's a, a lot of good feeling to, 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 um, to this work. Additionally, I sifted it through my parents first because they're kind <laughs> of, they're my barometer for ah. you know, what I, um, normal people will like. You know what I mean? <laughs> I, I, I know it's a lot of money to, to, to take a risk and, and spend on a um, relatively unknown concerto or, you know, when, when you could be playing Beethoven or Brahms. But I like the excitement and the vigor of bringing living composers' works to my violin repertoire. And my parents love the piece. It's How got cool. elements of Prokofiev mixed with John Williams. It's got elements of John Adams mixed in. But it is very Jim Stevenson. And uh, he's just been delightful to work with. You know, I've sent him Facebook notes now and then. I'm like, uh, can I change this Boeing? Or how fast <laughs> do you really want this? And, and it's, just been, it's just been delightful. That is so cool. Now, you're also active as a chamber musician. Now, you were just mentioning Jennifer Higgin. We actually had her on the show a couple episodes back. She's fantastic, fantastic. We can't say enough things about how amazing she is oh, as I a know. composer. And it's the fact that she's won the Pulitzer Prize for her violin concerto, which you mentioned that you performed. And it's fo so funny that you performed it because it, uh, I think Jennifer had mentioned that after Hilary Hahn performed it, it sounded so fiendishly difficult. Everybody was thinking, who in the world is going to be able to play it <laughs> after Hillary? And you obviously have the chops to do that. So this just goes to show what level of playing you are at. So anyway, <laughs> congratulations on that. But uh, just back to your work as a chamber musician. In 2011, you performed Jennifer's Piano Trio at the Grand Teton Summer, Fest Summer Music Festival under her supervision. Can you describe yes. that piece? And we're going to hear a little bit of it. And can you describe also what it was like working directly with Jennifer? Well, when I heard that I was going to be playing this and I looked up who Jennifer Higdon was, I was immediately excited, um, nervous. 
And I, I practiced this piece, which was not easy for a very long time. And when I met her, I was like, oh, you are, you're quite wonderful. You're <laughs> excellent to work with. You're just so humble. And, and, and yeah. her, her intention and sincerity was just so real to me um, that all of my nerves just disappeared. And I just wanted to make music for the sake of music. And because of her personality, I think that really opened that door. Um, the piece was perfect out there because the, the title of the, each of the two movements, one was pale yellow and the other was fiery red. <laughs> and right during that season out there, all the reds, the fiery red um, Indian paintbrush are blooming and these pale yellow flowers, fields of them are blooming. And it's just the, the soaring of one movement and the exhilaration of another just kind of represented for me personally. Um, my stay out there. seem to have some wonderful experiences working directly with living composers. Is that something that you proactively seek out whenever you have an opportunity to perform? It Actually, the, the first one was with Jennifer, and I realized how important it was to have that connection to, to audiences right now um, and composers, because if we don't perpetuate this art, we're going to lose it. If we keep playing Beethoven and Brahms and, you know, how many times will it take before we kind of like go, well, I've heard that. I don't think I'm going to go to that concert because I've, I've been, you know, four or five times. I think we need to bring new things into the repertoire. And there's a lot of really great new composers out there, new repertoire that's coming. And to make it accessible to people, to open the door, let them choose to come in and, and listen, and they will be coming back. Everybody that came to the concerto last year they wanted, they wanted more Jennifer Higdon. And we had mm. people in the audience of, of the Violin Concerto last year fly down to Santa Fe to see the premiere of her Cold Mountain. Yes. So just getting the right personalities and, and giving the right opportunities, I think is going to perpetuate um, the classical arts. Now, you have an interesting story about how you fell in love with the violin as a child. Could you share that story, please? Yes, uh, I had... Um, general music class in, in elementary school and we would um, sit around and our teacher would play music for us and one day she played Scheherazade and she gave us the story of it and she said here the instrument that represents the princess is the violin you can hear the violin pleading and I thought this is amazing. Now, how old were you at the time? I was in second grade and it really it, it moved me I was it it um, got my creativity going it, it could see the story in my head and and for a kid to to hear a story and then have it attached to such a monumental work really affected me and then 
in fourth grade when it came time to pick the instruments, of course, I wanted to be the princess. <laughs> so, um, and ironically, I, I just wrote a blog a couple of actually last month about, you know, thank your music teacher, thank the first teacher. I didn't know she was still living. And I found out her address. She's 91 years old. Oh, I sent wow. her a thank you note. And I said, I wanted you to know how much you um, shaped my future career, whether you knew it or not. And by the way, we're playing Scheherazade in April. And oh. So I, I, and she wrote me a note back. I was like, that's, that's amazing. She's so wow. um, that just kind of, that was the beginning. It's amazing. The impact we have the teachers have on their children, the, the children that they work with, and the, the lives that, that infect so many. It's such an r- amazing ripple effect in the culture. It's just incredible. It really was. She gave me a great gift. Just to step back a bit, I want to go back towards your blog, which is incredibly popular. How long have you been blogging now? Uh, I think since about 2007. Oh, my goodness. So. Wow, 10 years? <laughs> Almost yeah, 10 gosh. years? So, <laughs> so what, what inspired you to start blogging? Um, I guess because I just needed an outlet. Um, I think at first I would write what bothered me in the industry. Um, and it was kind of a, an exercise in um, sorting out my thoughts and, you know, frustrations. And when I would write my frustrations or thoughts down about the industry, I realized oh, I could I could probably adjust this and, and change the angle a little bit and add a few suggestions. And then later on, it became like, well, I'm getting an audience. What do I want to change or who do I want to reach? And it became more like, here's what's wrong in the industry. Here's how we can change it. Um, here's how we can open some doors to people. And and it's been quite an interesting dialogue. Mm, mm. And, and how do you stay motivated to be so creative over such a long stretch of time. It's the audience that I talk to now, and they they come up with questions. They I see through their eyes. I see through my parents' eyes, and I realize what we can be doing better to create that open atmosphere, open door atmosphere. And I, these things kind of write themselves. There are certain instances where they, you know, I'll just be on a plane ride with somebody, and my seatmate will say, "Oh, what." what kind of music do you play? And we'll be talking and they'll talk about movie music or whatever. And I'm like, oh, well, if you like movie music, you'll like what we're playing. Why don't you come to our concert? And and that created an idea for a blog of um, selling tickets at 30,000 feet. (laughs) 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 I mean, it's just, it's, it's random, whatever, whatever strikes me. And um, I I try to also write about how I deal with my career and the um, bringing back Jennifer Higdon into the into the conversation um, experiment that I did last year. I had a cocktail created in her in for her her concerto. Oh, what is it called? It was called the Higdon. (laughs) Of course. (laughs) What I did was I took her concerto to a bartender at a, a kind of swanky bar and I said, I want you to listen to this and come up with a metaphor. And I, cap- I captured everything the bartender did and um, kind of wrote down all the ingredients and created this, this blog and, sh- and then shared with the blog audience the curiosity it created in, in the town of Chattanooga. That, they, they kind of sold out of uh, certain liquors with, that created that, <laughs> that drink on the, the night of the performance. But it also allowed for a door to be open for people to go, oh, it's new music, but wow, this is how to enjoy it. Yeah. So, so tell, tell us what, what goes into a Higdon. Oh, uh, gosh. I'd have to pull up that blog to find the exact um, – Concoction. Okay, but so had, we'll we'll try to link to it in our show notes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> what, is, how, what does it taste like? Oh, it's 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 fresh. I mean, I, the the bartender was extremely talented. He could have just done a you know a quick Cosmo esque kind of cocktail, but this was very individual, and it really captured the essence of the concerto beautifully. Mm. I've shared the recipe with Jennifer <laughs> 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 privately, um, but it, it's a very fresh and. Um, citrusy almost to the point of over citrusy but then it gets cut with a little ginger syrup to bring it back it really does represent the concerto quite nicely but how cool so the, now you're gonna have to come up with the stevenson drink or some sort when you play your concerto I, with this concerto next year <laughs> I, I will try to f- come up with something fun <laughs> too much fun now well we've been friends on facebook and i was really struck actually just a few days ago that you mentioned on p- facebook that 10 years ago 
you walked away from a full-time orchestra job that you frankly didn't enjoy. People were worried for you, saying, what will you do? What if you never play in an orchestra again? You know it's really hard to win a job. Why not just, why not just tough it out? And you mentioned that you're 1,000% happier <laughs> since that decision. Now, as your friends had mentioned, it is really, really difficult. The competition is so stiff for musicians to win full-time orchestra jobs. If you don't mind sharing, what made you unhappy in that particular situation? I think it was a buildup of um, situations starting back in high school all the way through college, youth orchestras. You get this expectation of, you know, you're going to try to get a job and you put out this number, this this financial number of what will equal success and you'll put out like all the benefits that equal success and you'll put out into your head um, the certain kind of brand name quality. So you you've got this combination that if I get a job in an orchestra that has X, Y, Z, I will be happy. And I won the job. And within a month, I kind of thought, this is not what was advertised. <laughs> so in what sense? What, I mean, was it in, a question of the salary was not what you expected? Or well, no, the salary, the salary was exactly what I expected. Hmm. Um, I think the, uh, the thing that started to uh, disappoint me was the insincerity in, in the whole organization. It wasn't just musicians, it wasn't just management, it wasn't audience. There was just a, a just a general feeling of insincerity. And then personally, it also felt like this is it. There is no real moving forward. I didn't feel like there, were, there could be career advancement kind of engaging qualities that would make me a better musician, always keeping me like hungry or whatever. Were you a uh, concert master in that position? No. Uh, okay. No. Okay. Um, this was a, one of my first jobs. I see. And um, I just thought, I don't like it. I don't, I don't feel like I'm artistically gratified. And as the, as the time, as the years went through, I stayed four and a half years. Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> I, I got further and further from the artistic goals that I had set as a, as a younger um, violinist. And I was just showing up and playing. Um, and I thought this is wrong. And I decided that I didn't need the job. It didn't define me. And I am still a worthy person without a job. So I'd saved up money over those four years because I knew basically within a few months that I was not going to be happy there. Oh, my. Um, and I saved up enough money and I, I walked away. Now, in the meantime, I had won a job in another orchestra, but it was kind of like out of the frying pan into the fire. Cause it was just, How so? Uh, the same situation, but oh, bigger. No. Oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it was, it was slightly more money. It was slightly a bigger orchestra. It had slightly better hall. And fortunately, I didn't take that job. I mean, it was kind of crushing when I decided, oh, I don't, it's just not going to work out. And I thought, you, you know, you beat yourself up for a couple months, like maybe I should have said yes and no. Um, but actually it took stepping back, um, just completely stopping, walking away from the career. And I stopped playing for about two months until oh, really? I really, I really needed to, to love the instrument again. I needed to need it. And stopping for a couple of months, I, we uprooted and moved to Chicago and, and just got reinvigorated here. Wow. And I took, I took sub auditions because I kind of wanted to play the field again. And I, I was subbing um, between Minnesota and Nashville and Milwaukee and National Symphony in D.C. Oh wow. And Lyric Opera. So I was running around and I was an, it was a great time. I had a wonderful time looking at different situations and then it also allowed me to reassess my job that I left and why I didn't like it and certain elements of why I didn't like it and what was working in these orchestras and what wasn't working in these orchestras. And after that, I got a list. I made a list for myself of what I needed um, to be successful. And it was um, a combination of being able to express myself artist artistically and also connect with the audience. I think that was one of the biggest things I was missing was a connection, a sincere connection. And that's what I have right now. Now, I, I think you've just nailed the frustrations of so many career orchestra musicians. They're just one person in a hundred. 
Yeah. And, uh, unless you're a particular instrument, let's say the, the principal flute or principal oboe, if you're a section violinist, you're one in a large crowd and you basically don't have, as you mentioned, the artistic freedom to express yourself. You bas- Your job is to follow the conductor, to follow right. the concertmaster. Mm-hmm. So uh, what were the things, so you just mentioned that you needed the ability to express yourself, you needed the ability to connect sincerely with your audience members. What advice do you have for section violinists, I mean, should they all walk away? Should I mean, or oh, are, no. there, are there things that orchestras can do to make section players more fulfilled or, or more satisfied, happier in those given positions? I've actually written a blog about this as well because <laughs> um, <laughs> it's basically a letter to myself. Um, the, this series of blogs was a letter to myself back um, ten years ago, uh, saying the get to the point, the point is happiness, you know, try to focus on what you're, you're bringing to the art. Um, but what I would, what I try to do with section violinists is, um, I, I want them to feel worth, I don't want them to feel overused. Um, I think if I was to do another section job, um, actually, should I take that back? In the Tetons, where I do play as a section violinist mostly, it, it is different. I feel needed. Um, there's much more camaraderie that happens. So, how is that generated? How is that camaraderie encouraged? I, you know, I think these are very important questions that I would love for more orchestras to consider. <laughs> yeah. it, it it comes from leadership, um, from the conductor to the principals back. If you've got a a um, a positive conductor, a positive uh, role model concertmaster, principal, um, it really is so important to set the tone. If the tone is, um, oh, I don't want to be here, this is so much work, I'd, oh, I can't believe how many Boeings I have to do, oh, I just, I can't even, um, that is contagious and it's toxic. Um, if you've got a concertmaster that is energetic, and, and I know one of the people you've talked with, David Kim, yes. um, absolutely the, the, the epitome of what you want on the front stand. He's energetic. You want to play well with him. You want to follow his lead. That's the kind of personality that shapes the orchestra. And when I say it's contagious, it goes fast. Any bit of negativity goes fast through the orchestra. I just want to touch, if you don't mind, we're just... This is such a fascinating question to mull over. You know, just thinking about the courage that you needed to leave security, in a sense. And I think one of the characteristics that I've noticed in myself and in so many other classical musicians, we have a fear of insecurity. You know, we practice like crazy to make sure that we're prepared 150, 200 percent. So we just don't miss that. We're so scared of missing notes. We're so scared of not performing to our optimum levels. And we're afraid of not having work, you know. And so when we have this secure teaching orchestra position, that becomes a sense golden handcuffs. I, I want to, if you don't mind, just dwelling a little bit more on what gave you the courage to break off those golden handcuffs in terms of, I know you were pursuing happiness, but what does that really mean? For me, I was losing who I was. I was losing what I'd worked for. I'd put in so much money and so much time, and I thought, this is not worth it. And I felt myself becoming a bitter person. Mm. And the more I stayed into in a situation the more bitter I got. And I thought this is going to be a health concern if I don't, uh, you know, extract myself. And I thought, I don't need this. It's, it does not uh, measure my worth by saying I have a full-time job. But that's the culture that orchestra musicians have. If you have a full-time job, you are a somebody. You (laughs) have made it. (laughs) And congratulations to you. Mm. Um, But it doesn't define you as a human being. And um, I think stepping back and realizing that and actually asking myself that hard question gave me the confidence to say, I don't need this orchestra. It does not own me and it doesn't define me. And it gave me the power to just stop because I was so unhappy. I didn't want to be playing violin in that situation. And like I said, I stopped for a couple of months until I found the reason why I play the violin so all tell, over again. So tell us the reason, because I, I think that's so vitally important. 
it was, and I think it's a great exercise for musicians who are burned out. Stop, stop and walk away, get away from your art and rediscover why you do what you do. So Holly, why do you play the violin? That is a question that I've, I've been asking myself, and the answer has changed from my beginning to right now. When I first started, I played because it was fun, and I liked the way it made me feel. Right now, though, I like the way it makes the audience feel. I need an audience, and the audience, I need an audience that enjoys music, that actually feels an emotion, and I like drawing the emotion out. I like getting people to look inward and to... Um, feel emotions that are clearly human feelings. Now, let's talk a little bit about your own violin. Now, every violin has a story. You perform on a 1917 Giovanni Cavani violin, which was previously owned by the, the late renowned soloist Eugene Fodor. Can you tell the story of how you acquired your violin and what attracted you to it? This is um, kind of fun because it was in Colorado where I bought the violin. I studied with a man named Harold Whippler, who also taught Eugene Fodor, the, the renowned violinist. And Eugene was always on the walls, these posters, <laughs> the records, and, and he was kind of like almost a deity, almost to us, all the kids that were following in his footsteps. And you've got this Colorado kid who's playing the international soloist and winning all these competitions, and, and he was the key to success. And about 20 years later, I was dropping off some bows, getting them rehaired at my, my bow rehair guy. And Eugene was, was dropping off some violins that he needed to sell. And we just bumped into each other. Yeah. other and I was like, oh, you're Eugene Fodor. <laughs> <laughs> Who the hell are you, kid? <laughs> <laughs> was this in Colorado, Chicago? This was, was in Colorado, Colorado still, okay. yeah. Okay, all right. And um, <clears throat> so I... I at that point, I had given up looking for violins. I was like, forget it. Because finding a violin for, for some violin this is, is like looking for a bathing suit. It's just so <laughs> frustrating <laughs> to find the one that's going to make you look the best. Or, or, or looking for a spouse. I mean, it's really yes. an, an, an intimate marriage between because that's is. A, that is your voice. That is who you are. And your identity has to be wrapped up in that instrument. It's <laughs> like looking for a spouse, isn't it? I think a little Absolutely. more important than looking for a bathing suit. <laughs> yes. So... Um, he, he had mentioned that he was dropping off these violins. I'm like, oh, can I try? And I tried one and I said, this is, this is awesome. This is really, really good. He goes, you should try Brahms on it. It'll sound fantastic with Brahms. So I started to play the Brahms concerto and he's like, oh, no, here, let me have that back. Here's how you play it. <laughs> <laughs> and then so he kind of gave me this impromptu lesson um, and he was pacing back and forth from room to room of this of the violin uh, maker's house and, and kind of like coaching at me and yelling at me. It's like, no, it needs to be more forte. No, you need to use more vibrato. It's got, it needs more passion. And, um, but anyway, so I walked away with the violin and um, gave him the, the check. <laughs> <laughs> no, wait, wait. So let's back up for a second. What about that violin was so, was so, was so wonderful? I mean, you, it sounds like you found something what what did that violin give you that no other violin seemed to be able to provide the violin gives honesty it sounds honest it's um which is a, kind of not really a musical term but some violins have a real throaty quality and i don't really prefer that like some stradivarius can sound a little muffled on the yes. g string or, or just a little fat or viola sounding and i didn't want that kind of sound yet i didn't want a tinny um, thin sound either. And this violin just had a, a nice roundness to it and an edge, but not too edgy. So it was, it, it was um, um, just like Goldilocks. It was just right. <laughs> and, it, and it's beautiful too. It's a beautiful violin. Not that I was looking for something pretty to look at. I just wanted something to play. Um, but it, it just, it was a real special violin. So if you don't mind, I'm going to go off on a little bit of a tangent. I understand that you have a reputation for hosting exquisite gourmet parties. <laughs> Could you describe them for me? What kind of parties do you host and what's involved in putting them together and who are they for? Well, they're mostly for uh, friends and colleagues and clients and um, just everybody. Uh, for example, uh, a number of years ago, I think it was 2010 
or so, I, I hosted the last dinner of the Titanic party. Oh. <laughs> and um, with all musicians, because I thought, what would be more ironic than having musicians eating the last dinner of the Titanic meal? Because the musicians, of course, on the Titanic didn't live yeah. um, and were treated pretty badly. But what I did was I had a number of musicians bring various dinners. I had the recipes from the original um, the, the ship. Wow. And um, we started off with the third course um stew and then we moved on to a second course fish and then we had a um, a salad of course that musician brought an iceberg lettuce because he thought it'd be funny <laughs> <laughs> troll, um, it was, troll 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 <laughs> <laughs> it was like a seven or eight course thing and wow. and some people showed up in in their tuxedos and it was just it was hilarious and it was just really kind of a, a loving tribute to um, musicians from a different time and, mm -hmm. and it was just a great way to celebrate um, around dinner. I also did a dinner where I wanted to have an artist from every background. I had um, some producers, people who, who write plays, I had an illustrator, I had a music critic, I had some people who were in operas, I had a Broadway singer and I kind of wanted to have like a dinner where we could just talk about our art and our concerns and and share and kind of cross pollinate and it was just really a great conversation i think we i think we went way into the wee hours on that one it's absolutely fascinating so it's really not just about the food it's really about who you bring and yeah. the atmosphere that you're trying to create and the creativity that you're trying to generate on multiple levels. It's, it sounds like, well, when am I invited? I would love to come well, to one of these parties. <laughs> I hope to have you. I think that'd be a blast. Oh, wow. Well, uh, I, I do have a sister who lives in Chicago, so I'll have to stop by. <laughs> well, make sure you let me know because I will, I will hook up and create kind of another one of these artist dinners. It'd be well, a lot of fun. That would be great. We'll have a musical. Hey, there you go. We'll have a musical life party <laughs> co-hosted co -hosted by Holly Mulcahy. <laughs> Let's do it. Seriously, awesome. let's do awesome. it. Awesome. So my final question, besides Jim Stevens's concerto performance next year, what other musical projects do you have lined up in the future that you're looking forward to? Musical projects coming up. Um, I'm doing some trios um, at the University of, uh, let's see, Chattanooga State. And that'll be in March. In April, um, April 2nd, I'm going to be playing in a prison. Ooh. And I've decided. <laughs> whoa, whoa, okay, whoa, whoa, okay. It's, Playing in a prison? Is it, I'm sorry. Were you incarcerated for something? <laughs> no. <laughs> I just I thought that um, between kind of what like um, watching Shawshank Redemption yes. and Orange Is the New Black and uh, realizing that I've had a really awesome life so far and I've never wanted for anything and I've never been put in a bad position where I had to make a bad choice or a worse choice. And um, I've, I'm very grateful for that. And I'd like to bring music to people who have made some bad choices in hopes that it helps, um, you know, give them some hope or give them a different perspective. And so I've put together a program for solo violin. I'll be oh, playing wow. the D minor partita, just the first four movements, but I'll be pairing it with By a living composer Bach, work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, J.S. Bach. Um, and I'll be pairing it with a living composer's work. Like I'll do a first movement and then I'll do a piece by Mark Mellitz, who is a Chicago composer. And then I'll do the second movement. And then I will do another, uh, I, haven't, I haven't picked the composer, but um, basically Jim Stevenson's uh, cadenza from the concerto will be last after the last movement of the, um, the, after the jig of the piece. So I think just kind of using counterpoint, which is um, kind of a musical dialogue within a single person's solo, is something that I'd like to share with the prisoners, some kind of like inner dialogue that they might want to listen to and, mm. and use. And I'm going to bring music to them. I'm going to bring the, the music copies. And I understand that they are learning guitar and um, various elements of music. So I hope to add some curiosity for them and kind of a, a light into their day. That's, and, fa that's uh, fantastic. I didn't realize that they had music programs in prisons. That's phenomenal. Um, this particular prison is a character and faith-based prison where it, you apply to go. It's a medium security, wow. um, but it's, it's people who really want to improve themselves. So it's not... Uh, I think that they will really need this and they will really want it. And I feel very sincere about offering it because um, I, I do believe that music has given me 
um, very good direction and a lot of people very good direction. And I really would like to share it. I wish you all the best in all of your future ventures, but particularly this this prison performance, I think it's going to have a profound effect on some folks who could really benefit from it in their lives. I, I wish you all the best with that. Thanks. Well, Holly, thank you so much for being on the show. We're going to have to have you, have you back next year when you're getting ready to play your concerto. We'll have to do a recap or just a, a preview, a re-preview before you do that performance. I'd love to have you back and maybe we can catch up and share some more stories together. That would be awesome. Well, thanks again. Thank you so much. For links to Holly's blog, Neoclassical, as well as the recipe for that Higden cocktail and links to some of the specific blog articles mentioned in this episode, be sure to visit the show notes at amusicallife.com. While you're there, be sure to sign up for our weekly newsletter to get the latest updates on show guests and special events like the lecture series I'll be giving at Anderson University near Indianapolis later this week. And if you enjoy this show, I hope you'll take a moment to post a quick review on iTunes by going to amusicallife.com forward slash review. Don't forget, you can also send me your feedback or your own musical stories by voicemail by going to amusicallife.com and looking for the Send Voicemail tab along the right side of the screen with your smartphone or computer. I'd love to hear from you. Until next time, I'm Hugh Sung, and I wish you a musical life.